Tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Sue McKay from Philanthropy New Zealand and a warm welcome to this um, very special webinar today with our VIP guest, the Honourable Louise Upston. Um, and it's been a bit of a chaotic day for our parliamentarians today, including Louise, with um, the decision to delay the general election and what that means for um, Parliament resuming sitting. So thank you very much to Louise for prioritising us today amongst that kind of changing situation. So um, Louise is the National Party spokesperson for the social development and social investment portfolios and she's been the MP for Topol for since 2008. Um, in the 2016 national-led government, Louise held a range of um, cabinet and other ministerial roles, um, including she was the Minister for the Corrections Portfolio and Louise is also ninth on the party list. So why we have invited Louise along today to talk to our um, funder members, as well as inviting other spokespeople from other parties to other sessions, is that we are hoping to um, build our relationships with um, politicians um, because of the sector's desire to work with the government of the day, and also to get a greater understanding of the National Party um, approach to philanthropy and grant making and where possible to um, community and the causes that funders um, care about and support. Um, we're also seeking greater political influence that will help us um, in our role to have more philanthropy and better philanthropy for the for the good of Aotearoa New Zealand. So Emma Weathy, um, who is beside me but is socially distancing, um, and I met with Louise a couple of months ago now, and one thing that Louise did invite was any good ideas the sector has um, and any specific policy proposals. So we have given Louise's office and other parties a paper that sets out some key areas that our membership have said that they care about. And I'll just kind of really quickly run through these now. Um, accessing imputation credit refunds, a review of the gaming sector, a greater community sector voice, and that's um, at the sector level for community um, groups and also at the official level for the public service and also at the political level um, with the hope that the community and voluntary sector minister would be with inside cabinet in the next government. Um, also seeking greater representation of philanthropy and government decision making to acknowledge that often there's co-investment there around shared goals and outcomes. Um, seek that government fully funds not-for-profit where governments are devolving their responsibility out um, in contracting the not-for-profit sector to deliver those core services. And many funders also see themselves as the risk capital of the social sector and what does that mean in terms of social innovation and philanthropy seed funding and where something is proven potentially government giving long-term support. Um, our sector is very interested in impact investment, including in the social housing area. Um, and there's, yeah, as I said, strong innovation, uh, strong interest in social innovation funds and impact bonds. So um, as uh, Louise knows, because she does engage um, with our sector, particularly in her own region, that you know, it's quite diverse and those points that I raised don't necessarily represent all um, the perspectives. There's no single or unanimous view within the sector. Just to finish the scene setting, I guess, sum it up by saying that the government and uh, philanthropy, we're interdependent um, and we do share, whichever government it is, we do share many, many common objectives and we're, we're always interested in how we can um, work together to make a bigger difference in those areas. So now I'm going to put three questions to Louise that um, we appreciate with her office and then we're going to move into discussion and Q&As um, before we wrap up by quarter to four. So to the audience, please do use the Q&A function to put forward your questions. Um, also feel free to chat. If you chat, everyone on the webinar can see it, including myself and including um, Louise. This webinar is being recorded. Um, but no one uh, will know who's asking questions and, and no one can see the chat later. So that's just available to those who are live. Okay, so without further ado, she used that great saying. Um, the first question for um, Louise, and welcome so much, Louise. Um, the first question is a nice broad one. It's um, how do you see the respective roles of government, philanthropy and the community sector? Thanks very much, Sue, and um, fantastic to have the opportunity to join you this afternoon. 
um, has been an interesting uh, day, but also an interesting um, few weeks. And I think that sort of provides a bit of the context in terms of some of the comments I, I want to make. So we put out our um, social, policy, social policy discussion document at the end of last year. And that was really about trying to um, put some ideas out, uh, engage with um, a very broad social sector, and then just get some feedback on, on our direction of thinking before we land policies uh, for the election and then come out um, to the public with them. So it's actually only recently that I've taken on the social investment portfolio as well. So I think that's kind of um, the place I want to start. The way, the way I describe it is, you know, you've got central government and regional government, local government, um, then you've got community, then you've got whānau, and then you've got individuals. And I actually see that um, one of the challenges we've got at the moment is when an individual has um, a problem, there's a view that the government or the state should fix it. Uh, whereas the National Party's view very clearly is that the first line of defence or the first line of support should be family or whānau, and then community. And I I'm probably putting um, philanthropy in that community box, and then there is um, central government or, or local government. And part of the problem has been in recent decades that we've lost the strength of the family and community sectors. Um, in community, I'm putting employers, um, I'm putting um, sports organisations, I'm putting funders, um, I'm putting NGOs, and, you know, quite a large uh, group sitting in there. And so it's about saying also who, who is best able to solve this problem. And we've, I think, over time, grown this expectation uh, particularly in, in some forms of government, that central government can fix anything. And the reality is, actually, the more local the service, uh, the more accurately, more successfully, I think that problem will be solved. So the views that we outline very clearly in our social policy discussion document are very much local driven. And actually, I've, I've seen in, in recent years also this increase in local philanthropy and making sure that's funding local activity for local results, um, but over the long, long haul. And I actually think that's something that would be good to see more of over time. It's also very much our view that government doesn't have all the answers and smaller government is, is better. And that means partnering with others to solve some of the challenges uh, we have. And, and, you know, you talk about um, poverty as an example. And so I'm sure as, you know, part of the discussion, we'll go into that a bit more. But, but I see the, the relationship between government, philanthropy and community as heavily linked. Um, but we do need to be clearer about who does what best. And I think in some times, the government sector has grown too much. And actually, then we get poorer outcomes for the very people that we're trying to have an impact on. And so that's probably a point of difference from um, the National Party over, over others. Thank you, Louise. Just touching on that discussion document you mentioned, this is a supplementary question, actually, not the <laughs> second question. Um, we did see that discussion document, which was quite fulsome and I think covered a lot of areas of interest for our members. I don't think that's available on um, on the website now. Um, do you, can you tell us, will there be more information coming out between now and the election on the positions? We had some, we had some work done on the National Party website, so it was um, down for, I think, only a matter of weeks, um, but it should be up again now. So there were 11 discussion documents that were put out um, mostly over last year. And I think um, that provides a lot of the kind of insight and thinking behind some of what will be our election policies. And it's, it's kind of strange actually thinking that a large amount of work was done then. So when we come out with individual election policies, they will seem in some ways light in detail, 
because the work's sitting in the discussion documents. Great, okay, well we'll have a look for that and we'll circulate it to um, people who have attended this webinar if we can put our fingers on it again. I'll, I'll, send you the, I'll send you the link so that you've got the soft copy of it. Okay, thank you for that because yes, it is quite fulsome in terms of the level of detail that was in it. Okay, so regarding those topic areas that we talked about before, um, what's National's response to some of those, the, the key areas? So the so the the tax one, uh, I I would be crossing on my revenue spokespeople person's um, toes if I responded to that. So uh, what I have done is passed on the individual proposals to our different spokespeople. Um, so that's obviously uh, a revenue one. The the gaming trusts is is really interesting, and probably fair to say in my own electorate. Um, We've had some pretty challenging uh, issues with uh, gaming over recent years. So I'm not sure if um, all of those who are participating today will be aware that the total electorate starts between Hamilton and Cambridge and takes in um, Cambridge, all of the towns in the South Waikato, including Tokoroa, um, Taupo, Turangi and down to Mount Tongariro. And so, you know, very aware, particularly of the issues in a lower socioeconomic community like Tokoroa that has a higher proportion of pokey machines than other areas. Um, and so I'm, if we look at sort of gaming reforms, that's more an area I'm interested in. It's actually preventing um, or reducing access to the machines in the first place. Uh, I, I think one of the fundamental issues we've got is the challenge between the pokies in the areas that create the greatest harm in the communities that have the greatest vulnerabilities. Um, so probably more of my focus has been on the gambling themselves as opposed to the um, distribution of the of the funds. Um, and I, th I think it's there's still work to still work to be done. And in that particular area, I'd be interested in you know, more detailed discussions with some of your members who um, have very clear ideas about it. Um, obviously, we've got, you know, organisations like the Grassroots Trust um, and some sporting ones that do get money from um, gaming trusts, but I, I still think there's room for improvement. Um, as I said, I've tended to focus more on the, the harm side of it. Um, just flicking over to the other other proposals. I think your your comment um, it, it's an interesting one in terms of advocacy for the Minister of Community and Voluntary. And I was a minister for three years, um, some of that time a minister outside cabinet and some inside. And I would say it's less of a less important than you would perhaps would think because the huge amount of work and discussion actually takes place in the cabinet committees. And so much of it is distilled in the cabinet committee that that's far more important than whether or not the person that holds the community and voluntary sector minister's hat sits at cabinet. Um, so I, I would, I, I can appreciate why you would have that view, but actually just want to reassure you that the bulk of the work, um, just as the bulk of the work in parliament is done in select committees for cabinet, the bulk of the work is done in cabinet committees. Um, and actually in the discussions, I know the current government has a different organisation of the work than we did. Um, but again, it was around um, streams of work and something that doesn't even require legislation. Your influence as a, as a minister outside cabinet is equal to those that are in, depending on what the subject is and um, you know, what, what you bring to the table. So I would say what is more important is whether or not your minister is actively engaging with the sector and continues to stay connected. Um, because you want to make sure that the minister um, is carrying your voice and you talked in your introductory comments so about partnership. So what are the issues of the sector? What are the, um, what are the problems? What are the solutions that you've brought forward? And are those being um, treated seriously. So I think that's that's far more important. 
do you feel you've got access um, to the minister? If you request a meeting, you should be able to get one um, and you should be able to raise issues um, in a free and frank environment um, so that the issues of your individual members as well as your organisation collectively um, has, a, has a voice. Um, in terms of, you know, the recognition of um, volunteers, uh, I think, you know, one of the things that's been very telling um, through the COVID health crisis is, you know, just how much people are willing to volunteer in their community. And I think we would have seen, be interesting to see, you know, research on this, the number of people who volunteered perhaps for the first time during COVID um, or who volunteered in ways that they hadn't otherwise. And every year I do volunteer morning teas in each of the three districts in my electorate. And it's amazing how many different organisations there are. And, and even though I've been in the job 12 years, I'm still finding new ones. And so I think one of the one of the challenges and opportunities is how do we how do we collectively raise awareness around volunteering? And one of my local high schools is encouraging every one of their senior students um, to take on a volunteering role. And I think that's that's part of it. You know, there's people that have said to me, oh, you know, we don't have the same amount of volunteering now because, um, you know, families are too busy and there's, you know, two, two parents working and, and whatever. And I actually, I reject that. I totally and absolutely reject that. Um, and it comes back to my opening comments about if individuals believe that the state can solve all of their problems, um, then they don't see the need for stronger and more caring communities and communities that they are active participants in. Um, so I actually see the two go hand in hand. Um, and it's about what do we need to do differently to strengthen the community sector? Um, some of it comes from um, getting rid of some of the, you know, bureaucracy and administration and rubbish that people have to do to kind of get on and do their job and not over-regulating them. And so some of what we attempted to do, um, I think it was sort of 2011, 2012, in supporting organisations to collaborate with the view that perhaps you can then get rid of some of the double or triple overheads so that the organisations could focus on what they do best. Um, not sure that we got as far as we would have liked with that, but that was the intent behind it. Um, but volunteering, I think, you know, getting that um, going through schools, it was great years ago to see, um, you know, organisations like BNZ showing their corporate responsibility by having a day that every one of their employees volunteered. Um, I think those sorts of things are, are important in terms of raising, raising the profile. Um, I would say one of the areas that we have um, said that we would look at is a review of the Charities Act. Um, we have a, a very large number of charities in New Zealand and I think sometimes that makes it more confusing uh, or for some individuals that perhaps want to, to, to give more, it's too crowded. And are they, do they trust the organisation they, they want to support? And I think what we tend to see is there's a problem, somebody comes up with a great idea, they create a new entity, try and get money for it. Actually, three other organisations in the community were already doing that. And now they get less because this new flash shiny one um, is getting the money. So I, I, proliferation is, is possibly a harsh word, but that's the one that springs to mind. And I'm not sure that more and more charitable organisations um, helps us do better work for the people who need it, who need it most. Uh, I think your policy proposal around uh, representation from philanthropic uh, organisations um, when key decisions are being made around future investment. 
I think particularly when we come through things like the COVID-19 recovery is, is valid. Um, I think if you look at some of, some of the decisions that have been made around uh, the economic recovery um, don't seem to have been made with a lot of, uh, let me be careful how I say this, uh, not very open and transparent in terms of the criteria on which the decisions are being made. And so when decisions are being made equally for social outcomes as opposed to economic outcomes, um, I do think there is, there is merit in having others around the table and the more local the better. So my view is I, I like the idea of um, regional social investment boards or you know, social commissioning uh, so that the you know, real people in those communities are involved in making those um, decisions. In terms of essential services um, for fully funding, um, I read the report, had a, had a meeting with um, the consultants from Martin Jenkins who read that, read that report. And I think to a, to a degree that's accurate. Um, what I wouldn't want to see is that any organisation um, stops attempting to innovate, to be more efficient, to operate more leanly, um, I actually think a lot of government departments could learn a lot from uh, NGOs and the way they operate and I wouldn't want to see it go the other way. So have, have they been funded uh, sufficiently uh, whether, whether it's been necessary? Um, I, would, I would accept no, they haven't. But I also want to make sure that um, the, the right incentives is the wrong word, but just yeah, so one of our policies, for example, is a social innovation fund. And, and I'd like to see that is used as an incentive um, for organisations to, to innovate, to, you know, be entrepreneurial like we know they are, um, and come up with new ways of working, as opposed to continuing to, to be funded at greater levels when we actually don't solve the problems um, and we're just purely funding on volume because I'm not sure that, again, uh, that solves the problems we want to solve. And that's why, you know, social investment is about how do we get in much earlier? How do we prevent some of the problems occurring as opposed to just feeding the beast um, and servicing misery further down the track? Um, I think that's, it feels like a rushed kind of whip through your um, policy proposals, but I haven't missed a page, have I? I, think I've got them. Yes, I, I mean, it's such a big area to try and, and cover in this short amount of time. I am interested if um, you could talk a little bit more, maybe in relation to the regional social investment boards or the social innovation fund, of how you see um, philanthropy and grant making playing a role in those two initiatives. Yeah, and I think one of, I'll just talk a little bit about the um, the place-based initiative that I led as Associate Minister of Education in, in Northland. And it was originally looking at, you know, the group of young, young children who are at greatest risk of harm. And the number was initially 500. And, and we had looked at uh, Kaikoi, um, Kaitaia and Otangare, which is a suburb in Whangarei. And, and one of the failings of the place-based initiative is that those three, three areas are totally different. So to have a place-based initiative for three very different places was not a, was not a good approach. Um, what was also very, very evident to me is, because um, despite officials not wanting me to meet with the families of those we were serving, I insisted. And I said, you know, these are the people we as the government are meant to be serving. And I actually want to sit with them and find out more about whether they see their needs are being met. And these are the families that have the most uh, complex, challenging and, you know, chaotic lives. And, and what, was, what was evident is that Government, government agencies were the last people they wanted to hear from and had no trust, no interest um, or anything. And that 
broken state of the relationship then meant um, having to you know work in a very different way so whoever had the door open to those people was then about how do we how do we um, get services to them I think one of one of the ways um, so with the if you look at that that's in Northland as a region, but those three areas had very different priorities. And so with, with this regional structure, um, you know, do you do it a region or do you do it even at a district level to say these are our priorities and this is our plan to solve some of those challenges. I think to have um, those who are, you know, funding involved in those discussions would be would be very helpful because you know one of the one of the challenges is who's got the longest relationship and who knows this community and who is embedded in this community and has been for quite some time and how do we make sure that their voice is there in terms of their ideas and their solutions um, and I'm I'm not of the view that um, so Yes, absolutely, the government should fund significant parts of it. Um, less of a view that they should be responsible for delivering the service. Uh, and if we're serious about solving these problems, we need innovation. And so they all of those parts come together. And, and what we learnt with things like Fano Ora is there's not a huge appetite um, for government agencies or government funded activities to be um, large on risk. And so while I think we need to be better at taking on greater levels of risk, we also need to, you know, partner with those who do have an ability to risk to, to, and fund that and then say, right, how do we, once it's been proven, once the impact has been measured, government then funds the new way of operating. And the social impact bonds were a way of doing that. Um, fair to say of the two that were started under Bill English, um, one didn't get very far and it might be a harsh assessment, but the assessment that's been given directly to me was that particular group of bureaucrats or the bureaucracy with the Ministry of Health were not at all interested and so it didn't go very far at all. Whereas the Young Offenders one was an organisation who'd worked in the space for 20 years and they were very, very willing. Um, and so that's why that one seemed to be more successful. Thank you for that. And that's actually a nice segue into a question that um, one of the audience has asked, which is with your belief in where the community sits, and that's going back to your model of Fano community, um, how do you propose to help support strengthening that group of organisations classed as community? So I guess, you know, when you talk about increased um, delivery through um, organisations that are closer, so that communities are getting what they need. Yeah, so, so some of it is, um, some of it's through funding and commissioning in different ways. And some of the detail around that, um, you know, commissioning for outcomes, for example, are in um, the discussion document. Trying to get rid of some of the rules and regulations. Um, so often that is associated with business. Um, but for me, it's very much also associated with community organisations and the voluntary sector um, so that we can make their precious time um, utilised in a way that they want. Um, and so you, you know, that's probably the, the biggest area of frustration when you talk to organisations, you know, they're sick of all of the, um, the amount of time it takes to, you know, tick boxes, do the reporting. Um, and I think contracting for longer periods of time, um, the high trust model is, is important. You know, we were, it was useful with the health crisis um, that the high trust model was, had to be deployed and was, and the sky didn't fall in. Um, so I think there's some real, really significant learnings that we can take um, from that period. Sometimes, uh, so I think part of it is longevity. Uh, one of the other complaints that uh, organisations um, talk about is this, this piloting mentality. 
and I saw it in my own community when we had the you know, social sector trials. Um, and so rather than having a trial, how do we fund an outcome and be willing to you know, modify it uh, along the way? And, and again, uh, I've seen how it works and doesn't work. And by having, so the, so the place-based initiative in Northland by not having others at the table, I think increase the risk of failure because the public servants are so, so allergic to risk. And I remember sitting in my office um, as a Minister of Corrections with the head of justice, education, police, corrections, um, senior um, deputy DG from health, saying success for me in Northland is having other ministers chew my ear to say, what the hell are you doing in Northland? You know, I really wanted um, each of the government departments to rattle the cages and push the boundaries so much I was getting complaints from colleagues. And to me, and I told them that was success for me. I didn't get any complaints. I didn't get one minister say to me, they were worried about what we were doing up there. Um, so by having others involved, um, philanthropic organisations, uh, other community organisations, um, you, you, I think you have a greater ability to push the public service um, to move. Thank you for that. And obviously the public service plays a really, really huge role in terms of um, any partnerships with the philanthropic and grant making sector. A aside from what you've um, already mentioned, are there any other ways that you could see that um, the government could support the public sector to um, change for the better in terms of flexibility, even if you think about it um, from that social investment or the social development kind of vote lens? And I think this is, this is where I think there are advantages in that, in that local level. So often if you can build a, a relationship with a local, like a regional commissioner type level or a regional manager level, and you can, because you know, some of them have got quite a bit of discretion um, and they're very committed to getting the outcomes. Um, so it's a matter of finding a way to do that. Um, they won't necessarily want um, it to, to reach the level of the minister. Um, they might want to quietly just get on and do things. And I've actually seen that uh, in corrections because each prison is, is run relatively independently. And so what one prison director would allow, the next one wouldn't necessarily. So to, to build local relationships and again, you know, design something locally that you can put in place um, might be an easy way to do it than trying to approach it um, from the top and trying to, you know, wade through layers of decision making. And often the best way is to, is to prove it um, with as little fuss as possible. And then say, guess what? Guess what we did? Um, and then push it, push it back up that way. That's great. And um, there was a question that came through in chat, which was a lovely question. Instead of asking you what um, you would do, the question was, what can philanthropy and grant making sector do to help um, to help you if if you were elected in, into the role of social development and social um, social investment minister? Well, I think you know one of the one of the great things, and I've I've come from a meeting this afternoon of an organisation that uh, looks after you know, children in foster care, and actually then the carers who have children in their care, uh, and she came with um, a list of solutions, and I think that's always a really good place to start. Um, so everybody can come forward with a problem, um, but to come forward with a solution or a number of options is. Um, a really a really fantastic way to kind of help get the job done. I mean, the, the reality is we, we all want the same thing. We all want to make a difference on the quality of people's lives. You know, some of you will be, you know, focused on um, 
violence, for example. Um, others are focused on how do we lift educational achievements so that every one of our young people get greater opportunities. Where we have differing, um, differing approaches is the path to get there. And actually, I don't think there are many wrong paths, but getting on the same path together um, means we're more likely to, to get that outcome. So to you know, have, have an organisation come forward with solutions um, and, and or, or options that you can then work together on, I think is a, is a really great way to do it. And there are some incredible examples out there of philanthropy and grant making um, doing that. They're coming up with the solutions, some great local partnerships with individual government agencies at the local or national level. So it really is about working out ways to highlight and learn from those, those areas of strength um, and also the ones that don't work so well to learn from the ones that haven't gone so well. Um, well we so be another be able to share those two. Um, I think there is a there is a reluctance in some circles to talk about the things that that didn't work, but the reality is if we don't and if we're not open and transparent about that, um, then we don't learn from it. And one of the things that continues to surprise me is how you know there's amazing work going on everywhere, and one of the, probably the biggest frustrations for me is. How do, how do you, how does everybody know that? Um, how, how do you have a, a better system for sharing all of the successes? And I think that's something that you can do through your members is to be able to share what's working um, so that other smaller communities can, can benefit from that. We'll have to put you on our newsletter list. It's full of amazing successes. Mm. <laughs> um, so we have another question here. Um, would you have a view on policy changes needing to happen to ensure New Zealand focuses and delivers on the 17 SDG goals, sustainable development goals? Yes, I think, um, again, that's one of those areas that's not, um, not talked about a lot. But what I think um, is important, is so if I think back to the work we had around the better public service targets, when you have goals and you have measures and you're public about um, progress on those measures, then you you combine the efforts. And I remember going and um, talking to primary school principals about both the ECE participation target and the NCEA level two target and said, you know, what are you doing about it? And they were like, oh, well, it's not ours. I'm like, well, of course it is, because you inherit the problems of low ECE participation and you contribute to NCEA level two. So, you know, I'm of the view that if, if we share these bigger goals, then we've got better chance of aligning all the different areas of work towards it, whether it's government, whether it's NGO, whether it's individual families. But we don't really sort of have any visible structure for that at the moment. It's um, I actually can't even think of, I can't think of any government reporting on it. And so, you know, we're either signed up and we're doing it and it's part of our overall plans or it's something that we've signed and we didn't really have any intention of deploying. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure right now which one it is. Great, thank you. Now, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, a lot of our members are really active in the space of the first 1,000 days of a child's life and how important um, that is. So the question is, what respective roles do you see government and philanthropy playing in that first 1,000 days of a child's life? Well, it's a, um, it's a topic that's dear to my heart. Uh, and um, you'll see over coming weeks um, our importance on that. Uh, and, and I think... Again, some of it, well, in this instance, there's, there seems to be plenty of research. And so I'm not sure that it's a shortage of research in terms of knowing how important the first thousand days is. In terms of um, development or products and services, 
I think there's still greater opportunity to ensure that what is happening during that time is, is evidence-based. So uh, you'll see more, of, more from us in, in coming days or weeks. But I, I thought I would just share with you why, you know, why that time frame is so important to me, because when Bill English asked me to be Minister of Corrections, he also um, wanted me to be Associate Minister of Education and gave me the responsibility of, you know, the kids most at risk of dropping out and said to me, if you want to uh, deal with the prison population growing, uh, one way to stop it is to look at the kids that are most at risk of dropping out or failing in school. And what I've learned in the coming up three years that I've been in the social development role is actually the time to interrupt it is in the first thousand days. And I refuse to give up on my aspiration that the time we change people's futures is in the first thousand days. Uh, and I'm I know so much of the awareness of how important it is has come from um, the work that um, philanthropy has funded. And so there's a lot more awareness about it now. Um, and that's obviously reaching um, policy makers as well, which is um, critical. But it's then taking it back out again so that it's something that every household knows. You know, we want every expecting parent to know how important the first thousand days is and what they do from the day they find out they're pregnant um, makes a difference to the quality of life of their their new child um, whether it's a planned pregnancy or not and so I think there's huge opportunities for how we um, government and philanthropy partner more on ensuring we get better outcomes from from for, for every life that that's entered it's great. Thank you so much, Louise, for taking time out of what was a very unpredictable day for you to um, talk to our members. Um, Emma has shared the discussion document so in, in the chat, and we will also send it around so you can take that off your to-do list, Louise. Um, we've got that one covered. I'd also like to thank our attendees today and also to especially thank the people behind the scenes who make this possible, which is Nikita in Louise's office and also the PNZ team. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you again, Louise. Um, take care, everybody, and um, we'll see you all again soon. Matiwa. Thanks very much. Bye.